Oh, thank you so much, Dan. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, are so thankful for your word. What a blessing to have it in our hands, in our language, that we can read it, uh, understand it, believe it. And then, Father, we pray this morning that we would seek to obey it. Would you speak through your word? Uh, encourage us, challenge us. Uh, for Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen. Um, well, if you were here last Sunday, it was, it was Vision Sunday, which was, uh, which was really, really exciting. We, we talked a little bit about where God uh, is leading us in 2024. This is the end of a five-year vision, uh, and we're, we're thinking about prayer and community. And as I mentioned last week, I do enjoy a play on words, so we've used this uh, strap line, Together with God. The idea of prioritizing community and prayer together. And, uh, and as I mentioned last week, that really is a theme of the Bible, that God is drawing a community to himself, that he would be their God, they would be his people, and we see that right the way through the scriptures. So we kicked off this uh, series last week uh, called Love God, based on the book of Exodus, about God taking the people out of Egypt and into the promised land uh, so that they would worship him. And today, we're going to be looking at uh, chapters four to six. We did uh, chapters one to four and a half uh, last week, and we're going to pick things up uh, from there and go towards the beginning of uh, chapter six this morning, thinking about the need for community and the need for prayer, that that actually is front and center into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The idea we need each other and we need time with the Lord. But let me just catch us up on the story, just in case you weren't here last week. We were ambitious last week in taking four chapters. We're going to be a bit ambitious as well today in what we're going to be covering. But if you're up for it, we'll, we'll plow on together. Does that sound okay? I did this last week and everyone went, all right. <laughs> So we'll see, we'll see where, we get, uh, where we get to. So, so Genesis ends with, with Jacob and his family going into Egypt, and that's the end of that story. But Exodus is the continuation of what happens a few generations later. Jacob's family go into Egypt. They prosper. They're doing really well. And then a new pharaoh comes in who doesn't particularly like that they're doing so well. The Israelites have gone from a family to a people. So he puts them into slavery. They're still increasing in number. So he does something absolutely awful and kills, starts to kill the boys, the baby boys that are born. And that's the context that we find, the beginning of Exodus and Moses being born into. And when Moses is born, he is placed in a basket on the Nile to get away from the Egyptians that might seek to kill him. But is discovered by Pharaoh's daughter, taken in. And then they want one of the Israelites to nurse him, who turns out to be his mum. How good is that? God is, is making a way in that way. Then uh, he is raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He grows up in the palace. And we learn last week that he kills an Egyptian and flees for his life to Midian. And Moses becomes a shepherd. And we were spotting the different parallels with Jesus last week. The fact that God's people needed deliverance and a baby was born. The fact that God's people needed deliverance and someone is a shepherd. And we'll spot these, uh, these links to Jesus all the way through. So last week, we were thinking about the burning bush and the call on Moses' life to be that person who will help deliver God's people out of Egypt. But Moses, like many of us, had questions. He was a little bit reluctant. And last, year, last week, we were thinking about what is our reaction to the call of God? When he asks us to follow him, when he asks us to, to do the things that he's calling us into, to play our part in being intentional. What does that look like? So after Moses' reluctance, we pick up the story uh, in chapter 4. And, um, and we're thinking today about this need for community and need for prayer. Moses uh, goes off to Egypt and we come to verse uh, 27 that we've had read where Moses meets Aaron and the people. Now, I don't know what comes to mind when you think about community, what pops into your head. When I was uh, 18 and went off to university, I had been a Christian for about three years or so, and I went to one of the great universities, not Oxford, not Cambridge, I went to Hull, and, um, and I had been, as I say, a Christian about three years or so, and I was excited about going to university, but I was also quite nervous. I realized from, from encouragements from others the importance of getting good community, of having others that would walk with me, encourage me, challenge me, help to form me into being a man of God. So I tried a few churches, and none of them particularly grabbed me. And I tried at the Christian Union, and none of the people there particularly uh, grabbed me. So I didn't really connect, and I struggled to find a community for about six months or so. 
unless you include the local takeaway and pub as a community. Um, anyway, so I ended up going nowhere, and as a result, I found a time where I really drifted. Have you ever had those seasons in life where you're not plugged in, you're not connected? Very easy to drift. I didn't have people speaking into my life. I didn't have people encouraging me. I wasn't encouraging others. It was a hard season because we're called to be with other Christians. We need each other. In Alpha, if you've ever been through Alpha, when we talk about the importance of the church in, uh, when it comes to community, Nicky Gumbel often uses this image, and I think it's so helpful. That when we're connected with others, it's much easier to burn for Jesus, to be on fire, to be encouraged. But what happens when you take a hot coal out of a fire? It soon stops being red hot. Now, the good news is, as soon as you pop it back in, it will burn again. It's a really helpful image to realize that we need one another as we journey in faith. And I could relate to that. So around the January, February, I'd been there in, in September. Around February, um, I felt I needed to do something about this because I realized I was responsible for my walk with the Lord. It wasn't down to the Christian Union. It wasn't down to the church leader. It was down t- to me. I was responsible. So uh, I got involved, and I didn't particularly find it easy at the time. Most people uh, had made connections and got to know one another. And then Christian uh, Union did something that's so Christian Union. They had, a, they had a meal out where you can invite people along, and they chose a vegetarian restaurant. <laughs> and uh, and uh, once I'd forgiven them for that, off we went, and uh, the rest is history. It's actually where Lucy and I met. We both uh, connected on the first time there. So uh, we need community. We need one another. And there are a variety of reasons, and this isn't exhaustive, but just as I was praying, these are a few reasons why we might need community. And the first one is this. Actually, it's very easy to be lonely in church. It's very easy to be lonely in church. Now, you might be sat here today, and you're, cu- you're surrounded by loads of people, but it's still very easy to be lonely. Because it's not just being with people, it's being known by people that community helps form us. It's about uh, being known by one another. We can turn up to church every week, but we need deep connections. We need to be in each other's lives. It's what the core of the church is. But also, there's something about accountability. I found it very easy to drift because no one was speaking into my life and going, be careful there. How are you doing with this? Can I, can I, can I make sure I come alongside you? Make good decisions. Helping us see the bits we miss, those shadow parts of our lives. C.S. Lewis says this, which I just love. Jesus works on us in all sorts of ways, but above all, he works on us through each other. I love that. How do we grow in Christ? We need to be connected in community so one another speak into our lives. But thirdly, it might be that we, we just need encouragement. It's so important to have people championing us. And it's so important that we do the same to others. If you did the spiritual gifts um, questionnaire that we did before Christmas, it might be you're here and you have the spiritual gift of encouragement. We need you in the church to build up the community of saints. Bonhoeffer says this, he who can no longer listen to his brother will soon no longer be listening to God either. We need to be intentional, connected, listening to each other. And as soon as we disassociate ourselves with community, it's very easy to be drifting away from the Lord. We have to be connected. We're not meant to be alone. One of the books I uh, read in lockdown, it feels a while ago now, was this book by uh, Alex Absalom. I absolutely love that name. I said this at nine o'clock. It rolls off the tongue, Alex Absalom. Um, It's much nicer to say than Gary Kenner. This book, Discipleship That Fits, talks about how Jesus had a number of different communities that he was connected in and the importance of there isn't a one size that fits all. So many churches will talk about the need to do Sunday worship and the need to do some level of small group. That has been the case for years. But this book suggests, actually, we need a number of different spaces that help us to connect. And he said that actually Jesus had five. He had the crowd. And that was a big gathering. We might say that that's the church gathering on a Sunday. He had the 70 that he sent out, a mid-sized community. We might say that's something like a cluster He had the 12, his disciples. We might say that's a bit similar to a small group. He had the three, which was Peter, James, and John. We might say that's something like a discipleship group. And he had the one. Anyone know who the one was? Father God. They were the five relationships that he had. And that might be something, there might be something there that that lands with us to go, do you know what? Actually, there's bits there I could really connect with. Because we will relate to different groups in different ways. 
It is absolutely impossible for all of us here this morning to know each other intimately. It's just not possible. It is with 12. It is even more so with three. And it absolutely is with one. We'll come to prayer in a moment. So there's something about community. And Moses meets Aaron and he meets the elders. And I think there is something significant about this encounter because this is the last time he meets with them before he goes into Egypt. And I think there's something about the need for one another before we embark on what God calls us to do. There's something about the need for one another. And I actually think there's uh, something exciting. Do you ever have those moments where you imagine the conversation? You want to eavesdrop on a certain conversation in the Bible. This is one of them for me. Because if we just rewind a little bit, Moses has met God in the burning bush. So the God of the universe has appeared in the burning bush and has said, I'm going to deliver the people out of Egypt. And Moses goes to the elders and says, you know that God we've been talking about, we've been worshipping, that that we've been following as a people for generations? He's turned up and he's on the move. Can you imagine that, that conversation? No wonder they're led to worship. Because God is doing something incredible. So they worship, they share the hope they have together. Moses needs his brother. He needs the elders. We need community. But as Christians, we are drawn into a very different kind of community. Because our community is in Christ. And that means when we're in Christ, we are connected with everyone else who is in Christ. Stephen Siemens puts it like this, when you believed in Christ, whether you were aware of it or not, you entered into the fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the fellowship of every other Christian who is part of that triune fellowship. Now, you belong to everyone else who belongs. Your faith may be individual, but it's not personal, except in relationship. In fact, you are only truly you in relationship to others. I love that. In other words, for those of you who are going, what on earth does that mean? Because I've just seen someone over there mouth that. Um, I am looking at you, Wetton. Um, but but when, when it, what that effectively means is you are drawn into a community that you are being formed into the person Jesus wants you to be only as part of a community with others. It's utterly unique, the church. And as Christ, we are united with him and with one another. Or as uh, Henry Nguyen puts it, he says this, the basis of Christian community isn't the family tie or the social or economic equality or shared oppression or complaint or mutual attraction, but the divine call. In other words, we are a community because God has called us to himself. We are a community because we are in Christ together. So there's a need for community. We're going to come back to how we respond to that. So that's the end of chapter 4. Chapter 5, we read Moses has his first encounter with Pharaoh. If you've got it in front of you, you follow this through. I'm just going to take a a quick paragraph to take us uh, through chapter 5. He says, let my people go. The Lord has spoken, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, well, I don't know this God. I'm not going to let them go. And more to the point, I'm quite annoyed that you've come to speak to me about this that you're not working, that you're not cracking on with what you should be doing. As a result of this, there's going to be a punishment. So you know the way the Egyptians used to provide all all of your straw so you could make the bricks we've asked you? Now, I'm not going to do that. Get your own straw, make your own bricks, your workload has increased because you dare come and speak to me. And that's what's going on here. So imagine Moses is now going... He goes to talk to God. And in this encounter, I think we find something beautiful about prayer. The need to pray between Moses and God in the beginning of chapter 6. At the beginning of each year, I often will review how things are going between me and Jesus. You know, how much time am I spending with him? What does my prayer life look like? What am I reading? I I do it each, each year. And I wonder what comes to mind if you do the same. How is my prayer life right now? Start of the year, how is my prayer life? What does that look like? And I imagine there'd be a variety of responses amongst us because some of us here have followed Jesus for decades and some of us have only followed him for days. And some of us have routines and have Bible reading plans and have quiet times and pilgrimages and walks and others were not sure how to start. We're learning how to do this. But actually, whether we uh, would say we're an expert in this or not, would most of us agree we need to grow in this area? Okay, would anyone not agree we need to grow in this area? And the, the reason we need to do this is actually God has decided to work through the prayers of his people. 
It's one of the beautiful things of Scripture. God has decided to work through the prayers of his people. Billy Graham says this, heaven is full of answers to prayers for which no one ever bothers to ask. I found that such an encouragement and a challenge. Why don't I just talk to God about that more? Because he's willing to say yes. But actually, because God works through us, when we pray, stuff happens. I said this, I've said this a couple of years ago when I was talking on prayer. When we pray, stuff actually happens. God's at work. Or as Karl Barth puts it, to clasp hand, hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. As soon as we pray, God gets involved. That's what he's like. So stuff happens when we pray. And there's a few things just to learn from this encounter um, that I'd like to pull out this morning, just before I uh, wrap things up. If you imagine Moses is talking to God, he knows a few things about God. The first thing is he knows that God is powerful. He has seen God appear in the burning bush. Remember, that's the worst title for that section of the scriptures because the bush didn't burn. Anyway, he appears at the burning bush. He's seen God move in power. He's seen the staff become a snake. He's seen God in action, signs and wonders. He knows he is powerful. And we can have the same confidence that this is who God is today. We read the scriptures and we see Jesus has authority over all things, over sickness, over death itself. And we know that the Holy Spirit is at work today in us, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We know God is powerful. That can help our prayer life. The second thing is we know God is with us. One of Moses' fears was he had to go back to Egypt, and God says, well, I will be with you. So when he prays, he knows God is powerful. He knows God is with him. And we know the same. Jesus was with his disciples, and the Holy Spirit goes with us. When Jesus died and rose again, he sent the Holy Spirit. We know the Spirit is with us. It's very interesting. Do you ever have that um, conversation with God when he says, it's better that I go, it's better that I go to the Father so I can give you the Holy Spirit. Have you ever gone, really? Really, Jesus? I struggle sometimes to believe that. Is it better that you're not here than you're here? And, uh, and to, just to show what I mean by that is, let me have a quick, and I really do want a show of hands here. Who would prefer Gary full of the Holy Spirit, preaching this morning. Okay, wait for it before you have your two options. Who would prefer Jesus? Okay, right. <laughs> Quick show of hands for Gary. Quick show of hands for Jesus. Surely it'd be better if Jesus was here doing this stuff. And yet, by going, he pours out his Spirit so each one of us can know his presence, can know his power, and he goes with each one of us. He isn't just with one or two. He is with everyone. God is powerful. God is with us. But the thing that I think we can get from this section about prayer is this. We know his name. We know his name. That changes everything. We know his name. One of the things we learned last week is that God isn't distant, that God is near, that God is personal, that God is relational, that we know his name. We pray for so many reasons, don't we? Do you ever pray for your kids in the morning as they go to school? You pray for them at bedtime. We pray for jobs, for decisions. We pray for a good day. We'll be praying that Liverpool will win later on. We pray for little things, the car parking space, all of that stuff. And we pray for the big things. We pray for breakthrough. We pray that God would heal diseases. We pray for, for signs and wonders in our time. And most people have prayed for a variety of reasons. But more than anything, we should pray because we get to be with God, because we know his name, and he calls us to himself. Prayer is that conversation with him. Moses models this brilliantly. He isn't sure what's going on. He doesn't sit down for a quiet time. He starts talking to God, as, he, as you would a good father, as you would who someone's near. You can have a conversation with the God who made heaven and earth. God is not distant. He is close. Prayer is so many things. It is interceding it absolutely is contemplative it absolutely is all of these wonderful things but it's relational more than anything and if any relationship is to thrive there must be a level of intentionality behind it if Lucy and I are going to grow in our marriage and I never speak to her I'm not sure it's going to go well if Dave and I are going to grow as friends I never speak to him I don't think it's going to go well but actually if I want to grow my relationship with Jesus I need to talk to him I need to make time to be with him Eugene Peterson says this, I can be active and pray, I can work and pray, but I cannot be busy and pray. I love that. 
In other words, it's not to say we can't be busy. It's, it's to say that when we spend time with Jesus, what, are we being distracted or are we being present? Are we being present? There's a need for community. There's a need for prayer. Moses needed it. We need it too. So just as I uh, come into land, let me just say, what, what is the response for us this morning? Well, wonderfully, God has been kind to us over the last uh, couple of years, and we have grown as a church. We've been able to plant last year, and that was so exciting. But I know we have a number of uh, those who are new to the church family, and it can be very, very easy to not feel connected with others with a church of our size. And I do want to just say one quick thing. If you have felt that you've not been connected in, you've not been missed, you've strung to find your place, I am deeply, deeply sorry that that's the case. And we do need to do better about that. But one of the things that we're focusing on this month is how to do that better, how to get community better at the local level with small groups and discipleship groups and all of these things. What size of community, what way of meeting would bless you right now? What way can you be intentional with him? And here are a number of ways that we could do that. Hopefully you've been given one of these cards as you've come in. If you like to go old school and use a pen, oh, absolutely brilliant. It's also online if you wanted to click something as well, if that's a bit easier. But do take this away or fill it in today if you already know where God is, is leading you for this next season. And for the next year, what would bless you for a community? Is it something like a cluster? And they, they are the mid-sized group up to about 30 people, we're planning to meet once a month as a way of connecting and doing life together. Is it a small group based on those six W's of word, welcome, witness, worship, welfare, and multiplication? It's an upside down W. <laughs> Is it a Bible study where we just want to get into the word together and have a longer extended time of reading and praying together through God's word? Is it a shared interest group? We have a number of different things that go on in the church. Is there something you could connect with another person who loves doing the same thing? And that works for you right now. Is it a discipleship group where with two or three you meet to, to read, to pray, and be accountable? Is it a book group where you go just for six weeks? I'd love to read something with someone. There are a number of different ways of doing this at different times of the week, different dates. What would work for you? We'd love, love to help create some of these connections for you. Chris Gascon, who's going to wave, he oversees the discipleship stuff in the church. He's going to be at the back. If you go, Chris, help me understand this a bit more. He'd, he'd love to, uh, ch to chat with you. He might also stop you leaving until you filled it in. No, not really. Um, that might be how we can respond uh, this, this morning. And it might be, uh, when it comes to prayer, we just think, do you know what? It's time to make some space for the Lord. What might that look like for you, for your prayer life this year? It, for, and again, that's very different. Some of us like to go for long walks and talk to Jesus. Some of us like quiet for, for a good hour. What works for you? But can I just say, if you're in community, it's much easier to be accountable and supported and encouraged in all of this. There's one thing this year that we can prioritize. How do we meet with others in a way that blesses each other and blesses Jesus? Shall we pray together?